welcome to this, our online evening service. Uh, it's good you can join us. Uh, we pray that you will be blessed uh, through worshipping with us, that you will be able to uh, focus on the Lord for this time that we, that we have together. Uh, just one thing I want to mention in the way of announcements. Uh, our normal Tuesday night midweek is resuming uh, th this coming week on Tuesday evening, 8pm. Uh, so you'd be welcome if you can make it along on, on Tuesday evening. We come to worship the Lord together. We read in 1 John chapter 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We rejoice that God loves us so dearly that he would, through Christ, call us to be uh, his children. We sing together, When I survey the wondrous cross. We've reached the end of, of the Psalms uh, in terms of our responsive readings. Uh, Psalm 150. Uh, as usual, uh, I will read the odd numbered verses, and if I could ask you to repeat with me uh, the even numbered verses. Psalm 150. This is God's Word. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We come now to bring our prayers, our prayers of praise and confession. Let us pray. Amen. 
Father, we thank you that you are a God who we can come to worship. We can bring you our worship, Lord. We can do that, Lord, in our own homes, um, during online services, Lord. We can do it in our own devotional times. Uh, we can worship you with our with our lips. We can worship you with our with our words, uh, with singing, Lord. We can come to you in prayer, uh, bringing our praise and our worship and our, and our thanks to you. Father, it's a blessing that we can come, that we can focus on you. You tell us so much about you, Lord, uh, in your word. You tell us about your character, Lord, so many aspects of, of your character, who you are, your nature, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this revelation of you through your word, Lord, that we can come, that we can we can focus on you, Lord. We can see how worthy you are of our praise. Father, we thank you that it is a joyous thing that we can come and worship you. It builds us up, Lord, coming to worship you. And focusing on you, Lord, it is, um, it is something that lifts our spirits. We thank you for worship, Lord. We thank you, Lord, also for um, the revelation of yourself through Christ, that you point us to Christ, that when we look to him, Lord, we, we see you, we see your nature, Father. We thank you that you have uh, told us in your word who Christ is, that he is uh, the Son of God, that he is God in every way, God, uh, God incarnate come to earth. Father, and we thank you that your word explains to us why Jesus come, what he has done for us, that he came, Lord, to, to die, to rise again, Lord, that we might know salvation, that we might know victory uh, over sin, that we might know eternal life, Lord. We thank you for, for what Jesus has done for us, that it has opened up the way to life, abundant life, Lord eternal life and we rejoice in that Lord we rejoice that you have called us now your children we are children of God through what Jesus has done we thank you Lord that Jesus also sets us an example that he shows us how to live that he shows us what a perfect life looks like Father we pray that you would Help us as we strive to live like Jesus and to be like him. We thank you for his teaching, Lord. The teaching that he, he gave while on earth and the teaching that we have, Lord, right through scripture, Lord, that shows us how to live. It, it shows us who you are, Lord. It directs us, um, it directs us in the way that we should walk. Father, we thank you that in Christ we see perfection. We see perfection, we see holiness. When we see Christ, we see our own inadequacies. We see our own brokenness. We see our own inability to, uh, to live that perfect life. We see how frequently, uh, we, how frequently we sin, Lord. How frequently we get things wrong. Lord, we are aware that we are a fallen and a broken people. So Lord, we come in just a, moments of, a moment of silence, Lord, to bring our confession to you, Lord. We do that now. Lord, you know our sin. You know our hearts. Uh, you know what is in the depths of our hearts, Lord, in every part of them. Father, we thank you that even though you know how sinful we are, that you forgive us willingly when we come to you in Christ, when we repent, when we confess our sin, you forgive, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you are a forgiving God. We thank you also, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that you give to us, that indwells us, that enables us, Lord, as we, as we seek to, uh, to live out 
to live out our identity uh, as children of God. Father, thank you that you give us strength when we need it. Thank you that your spirit guides us, uh, that it provokes us, uh, that it, uh, on occasions, Lord, reveals our sin to us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit given to us to live within us, uh, that he is uh, the helper that we need. Help us to rely on you, to rely on your Holy Spirit in, in our lives, Lord. Father, we pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen. We're going to continue worshiping now as we sing together, Lord enthroned in heavenly splendor. So we're continuing to look at, at Colossians to work our way through uh, that letter that, that Paul wrote to the church in, in Colossae. Um, if you have your Bibles there, uh, we're going to read from chapter 3, uh, verse 18. Chapter 3, verse 18. Colossians. This is God's word. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the, Lord as a, uh, from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know 
that you also have a master in heaven. Amen. We thank God for this, his word to us this evening. We're going to bring our prayers for others now. Let us pray. Father, we continue in difficult and uncertain days. But Lord, in this time, we look to you. We look to you, Lord, knowing your trustworthiness, knowing that you are in control, uh, knowing that you have all things in, in your hand, Lord. Father, we want to bring to you, Lord, those who, who are suffering with this virus uh, as it spreads, Lord, those who are um, having symptoms, Lord, those who are particularly unwell with it at, at this time, Lord. We pray that you would be near to them, Lord, that they'd be looking to you, Lord, looking to you for your comfort uh, and for your healing, Lord. Lord, we want to pray for our healthcare workers at, at this time, Lord, and our healthcare system, Lord, as um, the pressure on it uh, is likely to grow over these next days and weeks, Lord. Father, we pray that you provide uh, our healthcare workers with all they need, Lord. Keep them safe uh, at this time, Lord. We pray that our health system would be able to cope uh, over these next weeks, Lord, uh, that they would have the resources that they need uh, at this time. Father, we're aware that there are many in hospital, Lord, at this time who um, have limited uh, access to their loved ones. Visiting is, is restricted, Lord. We pray you would be with them, Lord. Feeling particularly cut off, Lord, um, find it perhaps hard not being able to see people. Uh, we pray that you would be their comfort. They would look to you, Lord. They would look to you through Christ, that they would know your presence and your comfort with them at this time. Also, Lord, for those in care, Lord, who also uh, are perhaps not permitted uh, many visitors, Lord. Be near them, Lord. Be close to them. May they know you as their um, as their friend, Lord, at their side, uh, that they would know your presence. And Father, we know also with the, the increased restrictions, restrictions in households at the moment, Lord, that um, people aren't able to see their, their immediate family, Lord, as, as much as they would like. And we pray for everyone who is feeling uh, deprived, Lord, of, of seeing loved ones at this time. Lord, may they know that um, in the future, there will be better days, Lord. There will be days when this virus will be passed. May they for now, Lord, just be able to trust you, to look to you, Lord, and, and to know uh, to know you as, as their strength, uh, to know you, Lord, um, very, very near to them at this time. Father, we are aware that many are fearful uh, for the future. Many are anxious as to what these next weeks, uh, months hold, Lord. Many are pessimistic uh, about about what will happen over these next days. Lord, may they look to you. May they trust, Lord, that you have, have all events that are coming up in your hands, Lord. Nothing happens without your uh, allowing it to happen. So Father, we look to you and we trust you at this time. Father, we are aware that many are suffering in terms of uh, in terms of income at this time lord particularly those in the hospitality and in industry lord um those in business father we pray for those who who are struggling perhaps to make ends meet at this time and also concerned for what these next weeks will bring in terms of uh, in terms of income lord may they trust you lord may you may they know that you provide that you are a god who, who does not let us people um his people suffer uh, beyond what they can cope with, Lord. Father, we want to also pray for our schools. We want to pray for our universities, our, our, our young people. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, that you will help uh, our young people just to be wise at this time, uh, to, to just to stay with the restrictions, Lord, um, to do what they have to do as far as uh, as far as what the restrictions require. We pray you would keep them safe uh, from this virus, Lord. And we just pray that the spread would be contained, especially amidst our young people at this time. And Lord, we also just continue to remember those in authority, those making the decisions, Lord, both uh, within Northern Ireland uh, and within the UK as a whole, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would very much guide them, Lord. 
give them all that they need, Lord, to make wise decisions. Uh, decisions that will that will help, Lord, to contain this uh, this, this outbreak. Um, also, while keeping uh, keeping the economy going, Lord. Father, we come to you trusting you in these days, knowing that you are faithful. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We again continue to worship as we sing, From heaven you came, helpless babe. Mm -hmm. that we read in Colossians 3 uh, through to Colossians 4. We're going to pray before we come to consider this passage together. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We pray that you would be glorified through it this evening. We pray also, Lord, that you would bless us through it, Lord, that we would be built up, uh, edified, Lord, that we would be able to hear you speak, Lord, and to put it into practice in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So before we get into this passage, let's just remind ourselves of, of the context here. In the first half of this letter, Paul has gone to great lengths to set out who Christ is and why he came. False teachers in Colossae seem to be teaching that other things were perhaps more important or, or at least equally as important as who Jesus was and what he had done. Just prior to this section, we see a section entitled uh, in the NIV, Rules for Holy Living. And the message to the Colossians was, now you are in Christ. So live this, live this out in your lives. Be who you are, was the heading that I used a couple of weeks ago when we looked at it together. You are now God's children. Behave in a manner which is in keeping with that. Live it out in your lives. In this section that we've come to today, he continues to tease out the practical implications for our lives of Jesus being God, of Jesus being God incarnate and Lord over all. If Jesus is God and he, he has made our salvation possible through his death and resurrection, then this must, this must have an impact uh, on how we live. Paul turns, turns his attention here to Christian homes and how we relate to each other uh, in this environment. He is promoting healthy relationships healthy relationships and hey who doesn't need to work on, on their relationships so what can we learn in this section about healthy relationships well firstly in all the relationship relationships Paul is writing about there is one key relationship one primary relationship that runs right through this passage we find the phrase the Lord six times through this passage and in addition, the phrase, master in heaven, uh, in verse 1 of chapter 4. Healthy relationships develop under the lordship of Christ. Healthy relationships develop under the lordship of Christ. Before we seek to build healthy relationships with each other, we need to be in a healthy relationship with the Lord. And we need to be nurturing and building that relationship. When this passage says the Lord, it is referring to Jesus. And verse 24 tells us that, uh, where we read, it is the Lord Jesus you are serving. Indeed, this is the key sentence in this passage. It is the Lord Jesus you are serving. When we consider all our other relationships, we consider them from the viewpoint of our relationship with Christ. And our attitude in, in our relationship with Christ is one of service. In our relationship with Christ, we first seek to serve him. And this attitude of service should be mirrored in, in all our other relationships. We seek to serve others, to put them before us. As Christians, we strive to be servants, to have the attitude of, of a servant. And this is what Jesus modeled for us. So there are three sets of relationships that Paul deals with here. Wives and husbands, firstly. Children and parents, secondly. And lastly, slaves and masters. And Paul sets each of these relationships in the context of people having a relationship with Christ. Healthy relationships develop under the Lordship of Christ. And Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This counts for relationships too. They will be lacking something if they are outside of Christ. We can't really build healthy relation, relationships outside of Christ. Wives are to submit to their husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Children are to obey their parents in everything for this pleases the Lord and slaves are to obey their earthly masters with reverence for the Lord. For these relationships to be healthy they must be in the context of those people being involved in a healthy relationship with Jesus. This is our primary relationship. As Christians we, start, we strive for those relationships to be healthy but if our relationship with Christ isn't healthy 
then these relationships will not be healthy either. We see the issue of submissiveness and authority in these verses. We see that submission to authority is necessary. Submission to authority is necessary. It's important. God has designed it the way that we live in an ordered society with authorities that are to be, we are to be submissive to. In Romans, we are told that everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. If we didn't have a government of some nature, society would soon disintegrate. We are called to submit to this authority. But to remember that God is our foremost authority, and that if a government is asking us to do something that is in clear contradiction to God's word, then we should say no. But otherwise, we are instructed to submit. But submission to authority, it's probably something that as a society, we are becoming increasingly resistant to. And this would be illustrated in the recent protests about government uh, COVID restrictions, which include social distancing uh, and the wearing of masks. Regulations that, of course, nobody is overjoyed about. But most of us can understand and appreciate the need for them. We therefore submit to the governing authorities by following the regulations. In the Presbyterian Church also we have lines of authority. Christ is, is the head of the church. And then in human terms, we have the General Assembly, which is our highest court uh, of authority. Then under the assembly, we have various presbyteries and then Kirk sessions uh, of individual churches. And this is a, a biblical model of authority in the church. It's ordered and the lower courts must submit uh, to the higher courts. God desires that the church should have order. In families and households, God equally wants these to be ordered, keeping clearly in focus that Christ is the head and that love is the primary principle. Now the notion that wives should, should submit to their husbands, in today's society, it's not a popular notion. Many would dismiss it very quickly, but yet, we are called to be submissive. We all are in different ways. Submissiveness is one of the key characteristics of a Christian. We submit to Christ who loves us deeply. Wives are called to submit to husbands who love them deeply. Children are called to obey and submit to their parents who love them dearly. In scripture, we see submission modeled for us by Jesus who while being equal with the Father, made himself subject to him. And we read in, in the first Corinthians, when he, that, that's the Father, had done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. And in Hebrews we read, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Jesus shows us what it means to be submissive. And in the context of first century Roman society, slaves are called to obey and submit to their masters. And I, and I will address the issue of slavery before, before I finish. But we see here how God has ordered things based on submission and authority. Loving submission and loving authority. Without order, the whole thing falls apart. My point is that submission to authority is necessary. It's necessary. God has ordained how society should work and how households should work. Every household ultimately should submit to Christ. Submission is, is a good thing and we all need to learn submission. I would also like you to note the reciprocal nature in all the relationships that Paul is addressing. Healthy relationships are reciprocal. Healthy relationships are reciprocal. If a wife is to be submissive, it's in the context of her um, 
been loved and cherished by her husband and her husband submitting to Christ. There must be no self-seeking on the part of the husband. This passage in Colossians seems to be a summarised version of a passage in Ephesians 5 going through to chapter 6 where Paul spends longer addressing these relationships. In it, husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Now, if we consider and reflect on Christ's love for the church, his totally self-sacrificial love. At our wedding, uh, I recall the minister spoke in this passage and I remember him making the point that he thought that the husband here had the much harder job loving his wife like Christ loved the church. Wives are called to submit to their husbands and husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. It's reciprocal, it's two way, different roles. It works well when it is two way. If it isn't two way, it doesn't work so well and it can fall apart very easily. Children are instructed to obey their parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Now I know for children and young people this can be hard. Parents don't always get it right. And sometimes you just can't really see or agree with the logic uh, for what your parents are asking you to do. So it can be a challenge to obey your parents. But that is what you are called to do because your parents love you and they have your best interests at heart and they have a good, good many years uh, more life experience than you do. And mostly when they ask you to do something, it's for a very good reason. Fathers are called on not to embitter their children. Now you could ask here, why? Why Paul doesn't make this instruction to both fathers and mothers? Possibly in his experience, it is fathers who are most likely to embitter their children. How might a father do this? Perhaps by unreasonable demands, by being cross all the time, perhaps by criticizing his son or daughter uh, in front of their friends, maybe by not really listening to them or by not seeking to really understand them. But again, it is reciprocal. It's two way. Each party has their clear responsibility under the Lordship of Christ. And it works well when both sides fulfill the God ordained responsibilities set out for them. Healthy relationships are reciprocal under the Lordship of Christ. Now, when we look uh, at the requirements regarding slaves and masters, we would have to say that these, by and large, can also be applied to employers and employees. Seek to be obedient to the authority that you are under in your work with regard to work matters and not just when their eye is on you but with sincerity of heart and with reverence for the Lord. We are called to work out whatever we do, verse 23, with all of our hearts, to give it our all. Now this can be tough, especially if you're in a job that you, you find uninspiring, tedious. I sometimes find it hard when I was a quantity surveyor because my job was to look after the finance. Uh, and when I worked for a builder, my job sometimes felt that it was just making wealthy men uh, even more wealthy. Possibly I was thinking of it in the wrong terms. As a young person studying, it can be difficult to work at it with all your heart if you're looking at a particular subject that makes no sense to you or are simply dull in your mind. But we are called to remind ourselves that it is the Lord that we are working for. It's the Lord Jesus we are serving. He's our boss. And that helps us. It helps us in whatever we're doing to do our best and to do it with integrity. The instructions to masters in chapter 4 verse 1 equally applies to employers. Provide what is right and fair for your employees. Pay them. Treat them fairly with respect. Don't expect them to work long overtime hours without paying them. A 
it's a reciprocal relationship. Both parties have responsibilities. It works both ways. Healthy relationships are reciprocal. So we see how God orders relationships so there are different roles and responsibilities. But healthy relationships have to be reciprocal under the Lordship of Christ. Finally, in this passage, I just want to address the issue of slavery. And some would argue that scripture here endorses slavery. But if we are reading carefully, we discover that Paul neither endorses or condemns slavery. But surely the Bible should condemn slavery rather than instructing slaves to obey their masters. So some would say. So why doesn't the Bible speak out about slavery here? Well, it's easy for us to look back from a 21st century perspective here and to be critical. But Paul here isn't wanting to change the entire, the entire social order uh, of the Roman Empire. But arguably he was planting seeds that would eventually would lead uh, to the end of, of legalised slavery. What Paul was instructing here to masters was, was extremely countercultural that you treat your slaves fairly, that you show them respect. In other words, treat them as human beings, not as a commodity. This letter is addressed to the church in Colossae, not to the leaders in society. Paul wants Christians to set an example as to how to treat people. He wants them to be a witness for Christ in that society by treating their slaves well, by showing them the love of Christ. He wanted the relationships between slaves and masters to be healthy and Christ-honouring. He is encouraging healthy Christ-honouring relationships. As Christian masters began to treat their slaves well, they would surely begin to see them more as human beings and realise that as they were made in God's image, they should not be oppressed as slaves. It did take another 1,800 years to get there, but finally slavery was abolished. The other question that we could ask here is, why did, pa why did Paul spend quite a large section here dealing with the issue of slaves and masters? And relatively speaking, so little dealing with marriages uh, and families. Well, the answer probably relates to the fact that this letter to the Colossians was probably brought from Rome, where Paul was in, was in prison. It was brought by a slave called Onesimus, who had deserted his master, Philemon, who lived in Colossae, and he'd gone to Rome to seek out Paul. And while he was with Paul, he had come to faith. And Paul had sent him back to, to Philemon with another letter, asking him to effectively forgive Onesimus for what he has done and to accept him back as a brother in Christ. So the whole issue of slaves and masters was at the forefront of Paul's mind and extremely relevant to the church in Colossae, especially to Philemon, who would have heard this letter been read out in the church when it was received. That's probably why Paul spends longer on it uh, in this letter to the Colossians. Let me summarise. Paul here is promoting healthy relationships. He's promoting these relationships amongst the Christians in Colossae. And right the way through this section, Paul says these relationships in the context of the one primary relationship, which is with Christ. This relationship must be healthy. It's the most important one. Healthy relationships develop under the Lordship of Christ. We've seen that submission to authority is necessary. It's important. God has ordered society so that we all must submit to one authority uh, or another. We need to learn submissiveness to God-ordained authorities. Finally, we address the issue of slavery. And we saw how Paul wasn't trying to challenge the entire social order of the Roman Empire, but simply trying to encourage healthy relationships between Christian masters and their slaves. 
Healthy Christ-honoring relationships. This passage calls us to take some time to reflect on our own relationships. How healthy are they? How is your relationship with Christ? Is it a close, a close relationship that you spend time maintaining and nurturing? Does your relationship with Christ impact and overflow into your other close relationships? Are these relationships healthy under the Lordship of Christ? Are they reciprocal and are they Christ honoring? Let's take a moment to be still and reflect on what God is saying to us through his word. Father, it is our desire that our relationships be healthy. We pray firstly, Lord, that our relationship with Christ, it would be healthy. We would, we would know that he is our Lord, that we must submit to him, that we must seek a closeness with him. We pray, Lord, that as we grow in our relationship with Christ, Lord, this would affect uh, and overflow into all our other relationships, Lord, that we would grow in our relationships with those closest to us, Lord, our wives, our husbands, our children, our friends, Lord, our work colleagues, that these relationships would grow as a result of our growing and ever closening relationship with Christ. Father, it is our desire that Christ be honoured in our relationships, Lord, that he be honoured. Lord, help us as we seek to put your instructions in your word, Lord, into practice in our daily lives, uh, in this week ahead. Help us, Lord, as we reflect on our relationships, Lord, to be able to see how we can work on them, improve them, how they can mature uh, and become more and more honouring to you and to Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing praise is, All to Jesus I Surrender.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Mm-hmm.